Good morning, brothers and sisters. Welcome to Walking with Jesus Through the Word, one chapter per day. I'm Michael Telercio, pastoral intern of Forest Hill Presbyterian Church. It's day 453 today. We're in 1 Kings chapter 4. And we've been seeing this transition in the book of 1 Kings from the throne of David to the throne of Solomon. David has handed his kingdom over to Solomon, his son, and Solomon has become established as the new king. We saw that at length in chapter 2, that transition time and what Solomon did in light of David's counsel. And then in chapter 3, we saw that Solomon has been equipped by God with wisdom to do justice in the land. And interestingly, we're going to see in chapter 4 today what that justice, what that godliness, what that wisdom produces what the result of it is and how it impacts Solomon's kingdom. We'll see that as we read, but first let's ask for the Lord's help before we open the word that he would open it to us so that in our hearts we could be changed by it. Let's pray. God, thank you for the privilege of being your servants, servants of an even better king than Solomon. We pray that as we look at Solomon's life today, we would be refreshed and encouraged to see how gracious you were to this man, and that we would be reminded that Solomon merely pointed us forward to an even greater king with an even greater kingdom, and that we would be grateful in our hearts, and we would be stirred up to want to serve and live for that king, Jesus, even uh, more fully, more completely, more submissively to him, and more joyfully. It's in his name we pray. Amen. All right, beginning in verse 1 of 1 Kings 4. King Solomon was king over all Israel, and these were his high officials. Azariah, the son of Zadok, was the priest. Eliareph and Ahijah, the sons of Shisha, were secretaries. Jehoshaphat, the son of Ahilud, was recorder. Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, was in command of the army. Zadok and Abiathar were priests. Azariah, the son of Nathan, was over the officers. Zabad, the son of Nathan, was priest and king's friend. Ahishar was in charge of the palace, and Adoniram, the son of Abda, was in charge of the forced labor. Solomon had twelve officers over all Israel who provided food for the king and his each man had to make provision for one month in the year. These were their names. Ben-Hur in the hill country of Ephraim, Ben-Deker in Mekaz, Shealbim, Beth Shemesh, and Elon Beth Hanan, Ben-Hesed in Araboth, to him belonged Silco and all the land of Hefer, Ben-Abinadab, in all Naphath Dor, he had Tephath, the daughter of Solomon, as his wife. Baana, the son of Ahilud, and Taanach, Megiddo, and all Bethshean, that is beside Zarethan below Jezreel, and from Bethshean to Abel Nahola, as far as the other side of Jachmium, Ben Geber in Ramoth Gilead. He had the villages of Jair, the son of Manasseh, which are in Gilead, and he had the region of Argob, which is in Bashan, sixty great cities with walls and bronze bars. Ahinadab, the son of Iddo, in Maanaim, Ahimeaz in Naphtali, he had taken Basimath, the daughter of Solomon, as his wife. Baana, the son of Hushai, and Asher, and Beeloth. Jehoshaphat, the son of Perua, and Issachar. Shimei, the son of Elah, and Benjamin. Geber, the son of Uri, and the land of Gilead. The country of Sihon, king of the Amorites, and of Og, king of Bashan. And there was one governor who was over the land. Judah and Israel were as many as the sand by the sea. They ate and drank and were happy. Solomon ruled over all the kingdoms, from the Euphrates to the land of the Philistines and to the border of Egypt. They brought tribute and served Solomon all the days of his life. Solomon's provision for one day was thirty cores of fine flour and sixty cores of meal, ten fat oxen and twenty pasture-fed cattle, a hundred sheep besides deer, gazelles, roebucks, and fattened fowl. For he had dominion over all the region west of the Euphrates, from Tifsa to Geza, over all the kings west of the Euphrates. And he had peace on all sides around him. And Judah and Israel lived in safety, from Dan even to Beersheba, every man under his vine and under his fig tree, all the days of Solomon. Solomon had also had 40,000 stalls of horses for his chariots, and 12,000 horsemen, 
and those officers supplied provisions for King Solomon and for all who came to King Solomon's table, each one in his month. They let nothing be lacking. Barley also and straw for the horses and swift steeds they brought to the place where it was required, each according to his duty. And God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding beyond measure, and breadth of mind like the sand on the seashore, so that Solomon's wisdom surpassed the wisdom of all the people of the east and all the wisdom of Egypt. For he was wiser than all other men, wiser than Ethan the Ezrahite and Heman, Calchol and Darda the sons of Maal, and his fame was in all the surrounding nations." He also spoke 3,000 proverbs, and his songs were 1,005. He spoke of trees, from the cedar that is in Lebanon to the hyssop that grows out of the wall. He spoke also of beasts and of birds and of reptiles and of fish. All people of all nations came to hear the wisdom of Solomon and from all the kings of the earth who had heard of his wisdom. First Kings chapter 4 is a glorious account of God's grace to Solomon and to those under his kingship. God has established him as the king after David, and he has blessed him in great abundance. We see at first that blessing coming in the form of officials, those who will stand with him as king, who will help him to do justice in the land, who will take care of various matters, who will provide food even. We see in verses four, uh, verses 7 down to uh, verse 19 that the men named there were also in charge of providing food for the king and his household. Such was the king's household that there were these 12 men who one for every month would provide food for the king and his household. Now, it's likely that such an abundance of food was required because the king was so generous to welcome people into his household. We know that David had a number of people that he had invited to eat at his table uh, every day. We know Mephibosheth was one of them. Here in today's passage, there's mention of Hushai's sons eating at Solomon's table. It's likely that his table was expanded to include so many uh, that he was essentially providing for many people even in his residence uh, not to mention just in terms of the the breadth of his kingdom and all of those whom god really was providing for through him and what an extensive kingdom it was verse 20 tells us that judah and israel were as many as the sand by the sea and then verse 21 says that Solomon ruled over all the kingdoms from the Euphrates to the land of the Philistines and to the border of Egypt. This is a huge kingdom. And verse 20b, his citizens ate and drank and were happy. This is a glorious kingdom. Words almost can't capture what this experience of being a citizen of Solomon's kingdom must have been like. And that's why I think it just continues to go on, almost back to the same type of uh, description that we already got. In verses 22 to 28 now, we're seeing more description of provision. Just one day, in just one day, Solomon's provision was 30 cores of fine flour, 60 cores of meal, all of this abundance, such that even by verse 28, barley and, and straw for the horses were were always at the ready. Even the animals were being provided for in great abundance. What a glorious kingdom. And then, and then we read in verses 29 down to the end of the chapter of Solomon's wisdom. We know from chapter 3 that God had given him wisdom to uh, rule uh, in, in judiciary matters. But here his wisdom extends beyond just that sphere to all of creation, really. Uh, he has uh, Verse 33, he has the ability to speak of trees uh, and of beasts, of, of birds, of reptiles, of fish. Solomon is amazingly wise, uh, the wisest man to ever live to this, to up to this point here, uh, and arguably the second wisest man in history. Uh, he spoke 3,000 proverbs and wrote over 1,000 songs. Uh, this is... This man blessed the people of Israel and Judah in 
ways that really can't be captured, such that other nations were coming to the people of Israel to, to hear Solomon's wisdom. And that should point us forward uh, to, to the time that we read of in Matthew chapter 6, where people are flocking to this descendant of Solomon, this greater king, Jesus. And they're listening to the wisdom that he is providing. And what he says in Matthew chapter 6 is this. Do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But God so clothes the grass of the field that's alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven. And so how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For all the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Brothers and sisters, God is calling us to seek first the kingdom of Jesus Christ and his righteousness. Even as we don't see the kind of provisions in our lives as Solomon's citizens saw in their day. As Christians, as people following King Jesus, we're going to see... Uh, a life ahead of us that's maybe not as clearly blessed as what we read of in 1 Kings 4. And yet Jesus is telling us, don't worry. Don't you worry. If God so clothed Solomon in the way that he did, and he clothes the lilies of the field even more gloriously, will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? God will provide for you, brothers and sisters. He will provide for his people. And it may not feel like it, but he is providing something greater in Christ Jesus, the true king, than what we can fathom, what we could anticipate. He's, he's clothing us with the righteousness that we need. He's providing food and he's providing clothing. He's providing sustenance for us that goes beyond what even the riches of 1 Kings 4 capture. And I say goes beyond because it's not a different kind of provision. It goes beyond the provision. That means that all that's read of in 1 Kings 4 is included in the kind of provision that Jesus makes for his people, that he promises his people in Matthew 6. All of what we read of, all that kind of provision is in store for us as well. And that's why Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. When we focus on what Jesus has come to secure for us, righteousness before God, a righteousness that we didn't have in and of ourselves, when we focus on that and we make that the, the central uh, point of our anxiety, if, if that's what occupies our attention and consumes our time, that we want to be righteous in Christ and live according to Christ's righteousness, then all of these other things will be added to us. All the kind of things that we read of in 1 Kings 4 will be added to us in God's timing. Brothers and sisters, Jesus died and rose again to secure people, to take us to be with him for a feast for a feast greater than what we read of today. And it's a perpetual feast. It's a day, it's a last day that goes on forever where we'll be able to feast with Jesus and his people evermore. That's what's in store for us as his people because he secured the righteousness that we needed. He has come to pick up all of the mess that we've made of our lives and our sin and our rejection of all the provision he had already granted to us. We, we wrote him off, but he came to, to be a humble servant, to, to empty himself of all of his glory that he already had, and to, to die and to rise again, taking captives, us, with him in his wake, in his train. And now we get to experience all of the abundance of his kingly rule that, that he has secured. We get to experience that with him, but 
Brothers and sisters, today, let's focus on his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added to us because of his grace, because of his kingship, because of his provision. Let's pray to Jesus now. Father, thank you that you've given us your son who is the king who has come to make us righteous through his life and death and resurrection. We are now right with you if we're in him and we have in store a glorious future. We have a glorious present already, even though uh, we may be tempted to be anxious. We may not see the kind of provision that we read of today in 1 Kings 4. It's in store. So may we pursue the righteousness, which is the most important thing, the righteousness of Jesus. He has gifted it to his people. May we live into it. May we live according to it. May we live it out in a way that pleases you and in a way that actually blesses others. May we call others to come into Jesus's kingdom through repentance of sin and turning to Jesus in faith and being given his righteousness and all the other things that come with it. Lord, may that be our focus. May it be our desire today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Brothers and sisters, go out with joy and worship King Jesus in a way that pursues his righteousness and looks forward with joy to all of the other things that he will add to to us as we pursue him and his righteousness. God bless you, brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm.